Hello everyone, I am Denise Douglas, Communications Director for State's Attorney Brave Boy. As you all know, this case with Caden Holland has gripped and shocked the community. Uh, the State's Attorney is here to talk about the outcome of today's hearing in which uh, Mr. Holland uh, pled guilty. We also have Mr. Diggs, who's with the ACE ASME uh, Union, and he will also make remarks. I'll go ahead and uh, turn things over to the State's Attorney. And any question that you have that may not be on topic, that may be about something else, we'll kind of save that for later and we can do it after. So after she speaks and after he speaks, we'll take questions pertaining to this case. Anything else um, we'll take afterwards. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Today, 16-year-old Caden Holland, also known as Baby K, has accepted responsibility and entered a guilty plea on charges of attempted first-degree murder and use of a firearm and a crime of violence. This uh, young individual admitted guilt today. From the beginning of this case, we have promised to hold Mr. Holland and those involved accountable and responsible for their actions. We also promise to pursue justice and ensure the safety for this community. We believe that the outcome accomplishes all of these goals. This was a very serious case. It was important for Mr. Holland and other young people to know that there are consequences for your actions. It does not matter how old you are. My job, that of prosecutor, that of top law enforcement officer, is to hold you or anyone who commits offenses here in our county accountable and protect and get justice for our victims. Last May, Mr. Holland and two other teams stormed onto a school bus and attacked another team. Mr. Holland was armed with a gun, pointed it at the team, and pulled the trigger three times in an attempt to kill him. Mr. Holland attempted to shoot the victim in his head and in his chest on multiple occasions. Fortunately, the gun malfunctioned and the victim survived. But clearly, he, as well as the bus driver and the bus aide, have been traumatized and impacted for the rest of their lives. I want to thank uh, President uh, Martin Diggs, who's with us today. You'll hear from him very shortly. He's with ACE AFSME, uh, Local 2250. Um, from the very outset of this case, he was contacted by my office. We wanted to ensure that he understood that we cared about the safety and security of not only our students, but also the employees who work uh, for our school system. Uh, they are there to provide transportation for our children to get an education. And what happened on that bus should not have happened. I want to thank the bus driver who prayed. Um, you could hear her on that video praying, asking that God intervene. And we are so get grateful that her prayers were answered. Mr. Holland is facing a tough and stiff and appropriate penalty. The state at the sentencing hearing will be asking and recommending a sentence of 60 years with all but 25 suspended. So that would be 25 years of executed time. And that may seem like a tough and lengthy sentence for someone so young, but the consequences, the result of what could have been had that gun fired would have been permanent. So we believe that this is an appropriate uh, request from the state. We also recognize that Mr. Holland is a young person. We recognize that 
he does have a future and we want him to have a quality and good future, one in which he can be successful and the community can be safe. And that is why both the prosecution and the defense are recommending that he serve his sentence at the Patuxent Youthful Offenders uh, Institution. That is an adult institution. It is a maximum security prison, but that prison does offer therapy, counseling, both individualized counseling as well as group counseling. The programs at uh, that institution, we believe, will provide Mr. Holland with the best opportunity for rehabilitation and to be able at some point in the future to re-enter our community safely. You know, there were a lot of things that we learned during this case, and I'm sure more that we'll learn during sentencing. What I've learned uh, about this case and about what happened to Mr. Holland throughout his life is that there were a series of failures. Fair failures in the household, uh, failures in uh, the school system. This is a young person that did not attend school regularly, and that is why we have again, really sent a very strong message around truancy. When kids are not in school, they're not there for a reason. We need to understand what that reason is. Parents have to absolutely be accountable and responsible for your children. You gotta not just love your children, you gotta show them that love by intervening in their lives, holding them accountable, setting boundaries, setting expectations for them. We've coordinated two anti-truancy events, uh, the first at Bladensburg High School and another uh, just a couple of weeks ago at Drew Freeman Middle School. Uh, we will be having other uh, truancy events coming up. This is a cautionary tale. This is a cautionary tale. There are so many kids, there are so many Mr. Hollands out there I'm concerned about their safety, and I'm concerned about the safety of our community. But parents, you have the power to make the difference. I don't want to have to make decisions or recommendations about your child's future. You should be the one that, that, that does that. But the only way that you're going to be in that position is by, by taking responsibility for your children. If you need help, reach out. There are services, the Department of Family Services, the Department of Social Services. We have a lot of community-based nonprofits at the local level and at the state level that can help you. But it is not acceptable not to ask for help and have your child not in school, committing offenses, and hurting individuals in our community. We cannot accept it. I want to thank and I appreciate the work of uh, our Homicide and Strategic Investigations Unit. Uh, Sherry Waldrop, uh, who is the unit chief, uh, led the prosecution of this case along with Dora Miles Moore. They did an excellent job. The reason why we got the plea today, I believe in large part, in addition to Mr. Holland wanting to take accountability, was because the case that we had put together was strong. My prosecutors understand that we have to send a strong message and that is a result of thorough, uh, uh, thorough investigations working hand in hand with the Prince George's County Police Department uh, to develop suspects, uh, to execute any search warrants that were appropriate, um, and then to put together a strong case. And we had a strong case here. But we think this is the appropriate outcome at this stage. And we look forward to the sentencing uh, that will occur uh, on, I believe it's May 17th at 1.30 p.m. Um, I would like uh, President Diggs to come up uh, to say a few words. Thank you so much. I'm President Martin Diggs of Ace Asked Me Local 2250. We represent over 6,000 employees in Prince George's County educational support personnel from bus drivers, food service workers, IT individuals, uh, garage workers, 
paraprofessionals, we take care of the students when they come to the school. Let me first also say I want to thank State's Attorney Brave Boy and her entire office because we have received an overwhelming amount of support from them, more support than I was expected and more support from Prince George's County School System. The things that we want to see change, the things that we would like to see happen within Prince George's County is that when we work with the school system and we have recommendations of individ from individuals who've worked with the school system for 20 years plus, take those recommendations into consideration. Look at them seriously and value our employees to make sure that they can create a safe environment for themselves and for our students to make sure that they can learn. This is tomorrow's future and we do not want the schoolyard to be the graveyard. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam State's Attorney, uh, it came out in the previous hearings uh, that this young man has been on probation Yes. And it essentially been released from probation despite repeated violations essentially not showing up. Uh, can you comment on that in light of this? Uh, if the system had worked, the juvenile justice system had worked the way it should have, is it possible that we wouldn't be here? You know, it's hard to speculate. Um, but what I will say is that the services that the uh, juvenile justice system provides are designed to rehabilitate our children. Uh, the fact is, uh, as we speak, if they do uh, not take advantage of the recommendations of the court in terms of what they should be doing while on probation, it's considered a technical violation. Um, the state uh, put in place a set of laws that essentially says that if uh, an individual commits a technical violation, uh, that their probation cannot be extended. That is one of the issues uh, that we uh, have asked that the uh, legislature address this year. So included in that juvenile bill, uh, excuse me, included in the juvenile bill are express provisions that would allow a judge to extend the term of probation for the types of violations that Mr. Holland had in his, um, in his juvenile case. Is it fair for us to report that he essentially suffered no consequence for violating his previous probation? You know, not, uh, and I don't know that, um, let me just say this. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, uh, what I can say is that he did not uh, complete uh, the treatment plan uh, provided by the court and that his, um, his decision not uh, to complete that program did not extend the term of his probation, and that was wrong, should have. And that is why we're in Annapolis right now, myself along with prosecutors across this state, asking the legislature to make changes in the juvenile justice system. Could you give an update on the other co-defendants, the two other boys as well, the 14-year-old girl who was... Who I, was I cannot at this time. And I'll ask uh, Sherry to kind of come up and comment on that. But what I can tell you is that, you know, our, our systems are different. Um, and so he started in, a, in the juvenile system there, and they have to make decisions on how they want to pursue the case. We've made our decision, and our decision came with um, very significant consequences, more significant than the consequences he would have faced in the juvenile system there. But whether or not it would have remained there is really up to DC. So. Sure, and I apologize, I didn't hear your question. I just want to make sure that I heard it before I respond. Uh, this defendant was facing a murder charge in the May of 23, but he was charged then, as our understanding, as a juvenile. We were told from the spokesperson that he may never serve any time in D.C. because he was charged with a juvenile there if he had been uh, charged with an adult here, which he was found guilty today. I'm just asking, are you guys in communication with the officials in D.C. on where his murder case uh, stands at all? Just now, now that he's been, he will be sentenced 
So I can't speak to DC's charging decisions or how they're going to proceed on their case. I can tell you that we have worked with DC um, in terms of the preparation of our case here. Um, I think for the uh, members of the media who were present for the juvenile waiver hearing, um, you saw that some information from that case was considered by the judge in the juvenile waiver hearing. So we certainly support the cooperation that we received from the Office of the Attorney General in securing that. Um, the DC homicide detective who was the charging officer was here and available to testify. So we have coordinated with them in that respect, but in terms of charging decisions or having any say in what they do, we don't. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. And the defense had the opportunity at sentencing to argue for less than 25, correct? Yes, they're free to allocute. Okay, so then the judge will actually decide how much time he actually gets. But the Stuxon Institute doesn't carry 25 years, so if he completes that program seven, eight years, he's done. No, that's not true. Okay. That's not true. And, 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 and many of our juvenile lifers, uh, who you may or may not know, um, they spent time in uh, the Youthful Offenders Program, and then they went to another facility after us completing that program. So the decisions uh, that Mr. Holland makes now, which many of them will be up to him uh, to pursue rehabilitation, um, will it will it will be his decisions that will determine his future, um, and so um, we believe that the sentence uh, that we're recommending is the appropriate sentence. But we also want him to get the treatment that he needs in order to be successful in any environment that he ends up in. So um, that is why our recommendation is what it is. So get out of that center uh, the treatment program at some point? How long does the that that's 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 potential yes yeah yeah he's, and that's happened in other cases uh, with other younger uh, defendants who are in the adult system if all goes well he's here 25 years in Texas or how does that you know that information will more information on the program that will that will be designed for him uh, will uh, likely be discussed at the uh, sentencing hearing, so I don't want to give too much information on that at this time. Yeah, along those lines, we got a little confused by a word I heard, heard in court, 25 executed. Yes. And, uh, so it uh, made it unclear to me whether or not he's uh, available for parole probation before 25 uh, years or so. He, he, would, he, 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 he would be, just like any other defendant, he would be able to accrue uh, diminishing credits and other, yes. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.